Cougs house. Yes, our Houston Cougars are 1-0, and but there are five things needed to take away from that game to get ready for Rice this weekend. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews, that break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater who came to stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way we can lay us on the Cougs into your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. If that's where you found us, it is so good to see you again. Remember to subscribe so we get 2,000 subscribers before that TCU game. Got a big giveaway on the way there. Be liking and commenting on the video so let us know you're in that contest for a jersey with the Big 12 logo on it. Uh, if, if you're talking about fixes from the weekend that we just had, getting ready for the weekend that we're about to have, and you don't quite know what to say, tell us if you're a green grapes person or a red grapes person. Person. All right, so here's the sit. We're going to kind of wrap up our talk about the UTSA game as we move into talking about the Rice game and the Bayou bucket. But there are some big things to talk about. First, talk about like one of the biggest things, and that's the big fellas. More on that in a moment. But in the second segment, I'll talk about some offensive fixes, two big offensive fixes that I think they need to make sure they do. And the last segment, two big defenses, defensive fixes, I should say, sorry, that I think the Houston Cougars need to do after the UTSA game, even as good as the defense was, to get ready for Rice. That being said, before we get too far into this, we need to talk a little bit about what the Bayou Bucket is. Um, this is a somewhat historic, I say somewhat, historic rivalry. Um, and I say that to say that, like, it's not necessarily a historic rivalry in the sense that it's always competitive. Um, and, you know, I guess it's probably more competitive the older you are. They've played 44 times, Houston and Rice, for the Bayou Bucket. Houston has won 33 of those 44 and has won seven in a row. They don't quite play every year. There was a period where both teams were in Conference USA where they did get to. Um, and then now that Houston is in the Big 12 and Rice is in the American, they need to schedule some of those out in the distance. I think there's actually room with schedules. They just haven't done it yet. It's a nice, uh, let's say, it's nice to have a road game in the city of Houston for sure. Now you can go back to 1974 when they actually bought a bucket as a trophy for this game. Um, that was the Houston Touchdown Club, if I remember correctly, in reading research for this. Um, bought an actual bucket as the trophy. That thing has since been upgraded to a little bit more expensive bucket. The most consistent years of this game were those. 20 early aughts kind of years in the conference USA days for Houston. I think, you know, Kevin Cobb, Case Keenan, those kind of days. Um, and honestly, Houston kind of owns the matchup. I mentioned 33 wins, just 11 losses for the Cougs. They won seven in a row with some inconsistencies in what years they do and don't play. That is, Houston has not lost to Rice since 2010. They did lose in 08 and 2010, though, so I guess that was kind of a, a nice period for Rice, or at least they thought it was. Um, Rice has not won back-to-back -back games in this contest or in this rivalry since 2000, 2001. Um, I say a lot to say that Rice is going to be chomping at the bit to get this win. And there are five things Houston's got to make sure they do after watching tape against USTSA to make sure that that does not happen. And the first and biggest thing does start with the big fellas. I mentioned them. I love talking line play. Line play makes football football as opposed to flag football. But I do think the interesting thing in looking at this is one of the biggest things Houston has to fix, I don't know that we'll get to see them fix against Rice because the biggest thing was moving heavy interior defensive tackles around. UTSA played three different guys over 340 pounds on the defense interior defensive line against Houston last weekend. Now, you can argue talent and speed and agility and those kinds of things, but that's Big 12 or bigger size linemen, right? And so that was a good test, and that's good film for Houston to have and work with, but that's not the contest this week, right? As Houston plays Rice, Rice has one player on the defensive line in the entire death chart listed as 330, so still lighter, and he's the biggest guy by a long shot, heaviest guy by a long shot, and he's listed as a backup interior guy. Um, that is to say, this is a very different defensive line, 
but it's very much one of Rice's strengths. And we look at the like pro football focus scores and trying to get something read analytically on who the most talented guys are for Rice. Um, the defense line had three of the highest four scores from the defense against the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I say that to say that like, while you look at the score and think that like, okay, you know, UT Austin did very well, it blew them out, they're supposed to do the start of the season. When you go back and watch the tape in the first half, Texas offensive line, which is a bunch of highly ranked recruits and all those kinds of things, really struggled with Rice's quickness and explosiveness off the ball. Um, and so I think that it's worth noting that Houston's got to be ready to move those guys around. I do think it looked like to me and watching back on UTSA for what has been three or not quite four full times now, um, it does look like Houston accounts for defensive linemen very well. That's they're finding the right guys when they're folding around on fold blocks, coming around the offensive line or a couple of kickouts, including one frustrating one to talk about in a minute at the end of the first quarter. Um, they find the right guy. They get a hat for a guy. They block him up their offensive five offensive linemen blocking five defensive players. Sometimes though, they just struggle with getting that double team or combo block right, locked up and off the ball. And I think that that's you know, a function of not getting to play a whole lot of 340-pound guys. As talented as Don and Wonko is, that's a great look at practice every day when they go ones versus ones. The only thing holding Dot back from being a surefire pro is being undersized, right? We'll talk more about Dot and replacing him in the, in the later segment. But blocking a 5'11", you know, 6-foot, 295 pound guy as athletic and strong as he is, is not quite the same contest or competition. Um, I think what's interesting in this one is that they got to account for guys like Rice's Braylon Carroll, who's six foot 290, or Josh Percy's more of a three technique edge rusher at 6'2, 245, right? Those guys are athletic and strong and explosive. And Houston's got to find a way to make sure they account for them. And it's a different kind of task. Now, Houston ran a lot of inside zone scheme against the UTSA. That's because UTSA lines up in an odd front and an odd front has naturally made gaps for an inside zone scheme. If you do it right, they also did all kinds of different fold plays in which line would block down on a defensive lineman at an angle. And then the head up guy on the defensive line would loop around, in the most simplest terms to loop around to lead block. Um, that block down was always accounted for, but it wasn't always executed well because you have these giant 340 pound linemen. And that was a little bit tough. It looked like for Houston in the early going of the game. I do think I should point out Houston got better running the ball over the course of the game and kind of wore UTSA down between running it often wasting clock and the heat that was Houston on Saturday. Um, but there were also bright spots in the first half that like didn't get it. And there's one play near the end of the first half. Uh, and this is not like, you know, Tony Mathis is new to the system. And, you know, the offensive line is also new to Coach Amani Gavi. But the one play I'll highlight as a thing that, like, can't go this way is it was fourth and one. Houston's cross midfield. Houston has a chance to, like, really, like, Houston scored. UTSA scored. Houston's got a chance to, like, score again and kind of turn this thing into a shootout or, or keep the offense going, et cetera. Great play from Donovan Smith to scramble and make it fourth and one. And Tony Mathis lines up in fourth and one, and they run – kind of a power look to the uh, to the near side of the screen. Um, and I said kind of a power look because they fold blocked the offensive line on the right side, but it wasn't like the backside guard pulling and, and kicked out with the guard uh, on the front side, so the near side. And then the pull-through lead blocker type was a tight end. Um, I believe it was a, a Laughlin. And in that instance, Mathis is running to his right and sees there's a linebacker in the hole like – behind the first down marker, but like probably, you know, a three yard gain on fourth and one and Mathis jumps cuts back to the left and tries to outrun the unblocked backside football player uh, because the backside of power and inside zone, the backside of schemes is unblocked because a, you're not going to make your quarterback block the backside guy and they have 11, you have 11 and B the likelihood that guy making play is not very high. Instead of, trying to, you know, take three yards and maybe make the guy miss and make more than that. I mean, he might have scored if he made that guy in the hole miss, Mathis, that is. He jump cuts back to try and outrun the backside guy around the left edge, and he doesn't, right? He gets sh stopped short. Remember, like, UTSA kind of got a little bit riled up after that and all those kinds of things. Um, you know, they later in the game fixed it, and so I don't mean to say that it's infixable because Mathis got it right later. But that's the kind of thing where, like, if he stays on his tracks on the right side, 
he might not score. Whereas if he jump cuts and makes the guy miss on the backside, he may have scored. Um, but he gets a first down, and, and that, that may be what we need in the system more in this office. I don't mean to like, again, Math has played very well down the stretch of the game and made the right play in the same kind of instance in the early part of the fourth quarter. So obviously someone talked to him and got it fixed, but they can't have those kinds of moments against Rice. They need to make sure they move the ball forward whenever possible. Make the thing a route early and get on with your day. Now, if you're trying to get on with your day, but you maybe have some trouble with your wheels. We got to talk a little bit about eBay Motors because if you're building a championship team, you got to make sure every player is perfect and is the perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors, the eBay Guaranteed Fit. You can be sure every part you need fits right. The first time around, just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check that the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop at eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be right back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. All right, so I mentioned that the next two of our five fixes here we're going to be things on the offense and um i think frankly there are probably people in the comment section telling me that oh parker the whole five things could be the offense and admittedly we are looking at three of the five things being offensive things um i will say that there were moments where houston was really really close to having a lot more like points again i mentioned in that first segment if they convert that fourth and one houston was kind of rolling right and so those kinds of moments right may have led to something I think one thing we got to fix, and this, so this is the second fix of the five, is Smith needs to continue, Donovan Smith, quarterback, needs to continue to ease in and be comfortable. And my thing, I'm learning more about this, and this is not how Texas Tech used him, and this is not necessarily what he was billed at coming out of high school, but Donovan Smith might be more comfortable in the straight pocket. Yes, um, I think people think of it the dual threat and the way he runs over people, and like that means you want to get him on the move so you can utilize that threat. But truthfully, numbers indicate he's throwing the ball better in a more traditional pass setting than play action on the run outside the pocket, right? Um, I think part of that is the new offense. And the new offense means that you got to make the right reads and read, reads that you maybe not be super comfortable making at the moment or at this point in the season because you've only been making them for a few months. That's your first time against live competition, et cetera. But in play action, those reads have to happen faster. You're faking the defense out and get your eyes up on number two or get your eyes on whatever defender you got to look at and those kinds of things. And you've already wasted that second or so faking the, the play and the defense line is barreling, barreling down at you, right? Um, I do think as a new quarterback or as a quarterback new to a system, I should say that's worth looking at. I do like that in the pocket, Donna Smith, and this is again looking at the analytics of Pro Football Focus, only had one turnover-worthy play, which is analytically speaking a play that was a 50-50 kind of this should could or couldn't have been a turnover kind of thing or something that was at least worse than favorable for Houston as far as turnover things go. And that was the deep jump ball he threw to Sam Brown. And when you look at it that way, it's like, oh, the only close turnover he had was trusting his dude to throw a jump ball. I like our receiver room. That's not a problem. And that's, again, a kid that was more comfortable in the pocket, and he wasn't slinging it and making questionable throws. Now, that's the way the analytics on it work. I do think the O'Loughlin throw at the end of the game where he fit in such a tight window, while it may not analytically be the same kind of risk profile or whatever, that was a tight window throw that was difficult to do. And credit where it's due, he got it done, right? Um, but that was also a risky throw as far as like a tight window. But he also got that one done. And so I think it's, you know, again, he was able to keep the ball in the right team's hands. That's going to be really important. But I think we got to do more stuff with him in the pocket and stay back in the pocket. Now, he did get sacked all three times, or he, all three of his sacks, I should say, were in non-play action plays. Um, and two of those, I remember... He like had the option to throw it away or like to throw into traffic and took a sack. If I remember, like there was clearly like you know a, a man jack in between two defenders in the middle of the field. He just takes the sack or whatever. And in doing that, I I understand what he's doing there too. So I don't actually hate it because he's a guy that's been told 
We got to limit the turnovers. He had a turnover problem in his last school, right? To some degree. And I wonder if, you know, that needs the next, the next part of the progression is finding your blitz breaks. The reason he got put under pressure and some, and all three of his sacks came from pressure uh, was there were moments in the game where UTSA sent what we call a positive blitz, meaning that they sent more than five guys, or if they kept the tight end more than six guys, they sent more guys after the quarterback than Houston had blocking. That means if everyone gets one person, someone's coming through free, right? And that's what we call it a positive blitz for the defense. Um, in those situations, as a quarterback new to this offense, Donovan Smith needs to know what we call the blitz break breaks are, right? So as a receiver, you're running a route, but you see that you know the linebackers all vanish. A blitz break would be instead of running a 10-yard in, you cut it at four and cut across the field because the linebackers have all blitz and there's a big open spot in the middle of the field, right? Or instead of running a deep post, you turn into a three-step slant because the linebackers are gone. Or if you've got a corner blitz come off the side, you just run a you know quick stop route and just sit there where the corner is now vacated, but don't run off to the safety. It's usually short throws that are in the spots where the blitzers are coming from. And as a guy new to this offense, finding what the reads Houston and Dana and you know the Houston offense looks like or where his receivers even like to go in those instances because it can be a lot of if this then that kind of reads does take time that that may develop but he's got to make sure we look for those as well um that's all Donovan Smith fixed things I think again a lot of those though was just getting comfortable in the offense and after you know you see a big jump between week one and two on guys like that that are new to the offense because they've got a game film to study right so you'll see what the effect of studying that game film is with Dana after last Saturday. The third thing and the final office thing I'm going to talk about is Matthew Golden needs to get loose. And I don't, I don't mean this to say that man Jack or Sam Brown or Josh Cobb or Boogie Johnson, or even, you know, John Wilson or, or Michael Harrison pilot, if they brought in freshmen or, Michael Laughlin at tight end. Those guys are all great pass catchers. I understand that. And frankly, in the middle of the field, Joseph Manjack is a heck of a zone breaker. The way he pivots his big body in the middle of a cover two zone in the soft spot. He like can box out like a power four to that instance. Or his one-on-one skinny post that he ran to get the touchdown, right, where he get the defender on his back and he's just too big and strong for that defender to get over the top of him. Houston has great pass catchers. But Golden's the best, and Golden needs to get loose. And I understand he had seven targets. He had four catches on the seven targets. But some of those were clearly forced plays were either Donovan or Mike Brichette calling plays or Dana Holgerson as the overseer of the whole thing. Someone made the decision that, like, a frustrated Matthew Golden needed to get the rocks on his way. And honestly, the more effective way to do that would be for Golden to find ways to shake loose in like normal concert with the offense earlier in the game uh, that those moments where he got fourth ball came in the second half, like late third of the UTSA game and UTSA admittedly like made it very clear. They were trying to take him away the same way. They tried to take tank Dell away last year. Ironically, both of them scored half the touchdowns of the games they respectively played in um, pro football focus had Matthew Golden with two drops. And I don't remember counting one, uh, I've been trying to find what they're calling the second one. It might be the ball that was kind of behind him. Uh, but those would be two of the three drops that Amon Smith is credited with, right? So that's a lot on him as well. Um, for what it's worth, Dana Holgerson has a radio show on Tuesday night. Um, first of all, took a moment to talk about how cool Ho- Jose Altuve is. I'm recommending for your second listen of the day to go check out Locked on Astros because they own Arlington. But – more, more importantly to the Houston Cougars, Dana Horkin took a moment to talk about how great a day of practice, independently without being at, how great a day of practice uh, Matthew Golden had. And he really spoke very highly of everyone's Tuesday of practice, but he talked about like there's a little bit extra juice after having a bad game for Matthew Golden. He wants to kind of prove people like he still is that guy and he doesn't need Tank taking away coverage or whatever, right? And so I think that that's a good thing as far as it goes. And frankly... Um, I don't see the same caliber athlete at Rice as I saw at UTSA. I do think, and this maybe works against Matthew, that Rice has a lot of veteran DBs that have played a lot of football, and they're not going to make mental mistakes. They might make athletic mistakes. They're not going to make a lot of mental mistakes. And so Matthew Golden's going to need to get loose. He's going to do it a little bit better than he did last week. 
Now, in the third segment, I've kind of devised it where I go my two defensive things here at the end. But I should probably preface this by saying that, honestly, the defense played very, very well. Three takeaways on a talented quarterback. Um, I understand that there are people talking about, like, when they want kind of a prevent defense up, you know, 10 points in the fourth quarter, they gave a lot of rush yards. Or that there was one drive in the fir- – the touchdown drive, I should say, in the first half. You should say it kind of had everything clicking and rolling. Uh, and they got, like, a big 28-yard reverse in that series as well, right? Um it wasn't a tricky reverse, but it was a deceptive reverse in the sense that there were other play action elements going misdirection elements. Not play action, misdirection, I'm sorry. Um, but the biggest thing on the defense to me, the biggest thing they gotta fix is we talked about it yesterday, and I'm gonna keep beating this drum. Dodwanko's replacement needs to find ways to make plays. Doesn't mean make tackles the same way it's not always about Dodd Wonko making tackles. His replacement needs to make plays. Um, and as I looked at it. You know, again, I've watched the tape not quite a complete four times. Um, Cedric Williams had his moments, was kind of on the boom bust side. He either made a great read, a great hold down of the double team, sat in the gap, etc., or he got moved off the spot. There wasn't a whole lot in between. We need more of the former, not the latter, right? Said, I don't think you disagree with me. You watch the film there. Like, that's something we got to get done. Uh, I'm Polisi Long, uh, didn't go backwards. But he also didn't like make plays. That is to say, that, like in one-on-one situations, he was fine. He didn't get blown off the ball. But he also didn't like move the offensive line back or puncture the offensive line or those kinds of things either. Right? Like we get used to Dot making those kind of plays, and I believe he didn't make those himself. Now Jamari Caldwell didn't get a whole lot of snaps, and for what it's worth, on Tuesday night we didn't get a whole lot out of Dana as far as when he or Nwanko would return, as unless I'm missing part of it because I am recording this, obviously, uh, honestly, quite not quite, it's not quite over. Um, but I will say that I feel like if Jamari Caldwell plays, that's a pretty good, not a Dot and Wonka replacement, but a pretty good replacement. And I should say also, like, we don't have confirmation that Dot's not playing against Rice. Ankles are tricky. Rice is not a conference opponent. And if both teams play their best without Dot, I do think Houston wins this game. So I'm not necessarily... Sure, he'll like it's worth it to suit him up this week as opposed to save him for the next week against TCU when they need him, right? Um, Akeem Ajala, okay, I'm gonna say this name correctly. Aji July, Aji Akeem Ajalaya. Um, it's a guy that I could think could come in some at nose. He lined up at nose somewhat after Wonko went down. Um, did have a couple of assists at tackles. Uh, first real like big time experience though in front of a big crowd um, and kind of similar to on police where he like not quite boom, not quite bust all the time, but you know, there's a little bit of variance there. We've got to kind of keep it more consistent. I'm intrigued by, and tell me what you think about this. Anthony Holmes. Anthony Holmes is a six to two hundred nine pound, five pound freshman um, red cert freshman, I should say. And I thought he played pretty well in watching the the film now he had two pressures and four total tackles and i would argue that he probably doesn't do as well as dot at the making the play without making the tackle so when he's not getting hands on the ball or hands the ball carrier it's not quite the same impact but i was intrigued um i also think in looking at you know moving cedric williams into the nose spot finding a three technique in your defensive end room because we have some depth of defensive end and pass rushing is important. The natural fit there, I think, is Brandon Mack. Now, Houston actually did a little bit more with uh, Nelson Caesar in that spot than they did Brandon Mack. But Brandon Mack was hurt during camp. He's the Ole Miss transfer, though. He's a big, strong 6'3", He's listed 245. That dude looks a lot bigger than that on, sna- on camera. Um, he did play 18 snaps against UTSA, which as an rota- edge rotational guy is normal so i don't think he's hurt but he did only play on the edge and so i don't know if he'd be willing to move into a three technique to move cedric down now that could also just be because that's all he's practiced and so like it's hard to like teach a guy you know new tricks in the middle of the game but we'll see replacing dot if you have not figured it out is a concern of mine moving forward and it's not because I think they need to rush him back or anything like that. And it, frankly, like I said, it's not the kind of thing where like they have to have him to beat Rice. It's that like, you know, the way I always talk about when I coach kids, it's like someone's going to break a shoelace. There's going to be situations where 
Doc catches a cramp or or you know something happens and you've got to find a way to replace him for a series in a game that they have to have him in. And so you got to make sure you have replacements that are strong enough. That's what I think they got to look for right now. The final thing, and this is mostly, I think, obvious, is Houston, whenever they're on the field on defense, has to be hollering where Luke McCaffrey lines up. He played 43 snaps at Texas. Um for rice he played two of those in a wildcat quarterback situation just one other in the backfield he played eight out wide and 32 in the slot so in a game where i'd argue rice probably doesn't want to show a lot of things off or give a lot of things away he still lined up in a lot of different places i'd imagine that with jt daniels being their new you know more traditional quarterback that there'll be all kinds of different gimmicks and gadgets and things like that to get him the ball uh, that is mccaffrey and frankly, we saw what kind of damage he could do last year, right? The big deep post over the middle and those kinds of things. Um, he's not a natural route runner out of the backfield. Um, but I, I do think that he's the kind of guy that has enough wiggle to him that you just want to make sure you find ways to get him the ball in space. Texas loaded him to just six targets and just two catches. Um, and, you know, say what you want about Texas. They do have athletes. Um, so Houston got to find a way to make that up. Short yardage threat makes me think you're going to want to put a Malik Fleming on, especially after how the dude balled out last weekend. But he's given up a lot of size. McCaffrey's at 6'2". Malik is, line, is listed as 5'8". That's giving him a little bit of size. I will say I trust him after hearing him. I mean, I've said this a couple times this week. Malik Fleming in the post game talking about preparation for his interceptions Makes me think we just need to put him on the best receiver every week. But I, coming into the year, really liked Alex Hogan. Alex is a little bit bigger guy, uh, so I can see bouncing back and forth there. Whatever it is, and here's the real key, I think the corner that is on him needs to funnel him towards A.J. Halsey and kind of be funneling and working towards the free safety in those instances because A.J. Halsey could murder that man. And... If AJ Halsey, you know, beats him up, I'm not, I'm not saying cheap shots or, or anything against the rules, but if AJ Halsey kind of roughs him, it's like, hey, we're not coming to the middle right here, pards. That could really change the dynamic of what Rice is trying to do. Now, I'm sure you've got things that Houston needs to do better. Um, I will say that part of the reason that I think they need to find McCaffrey is not because they didn't do great on defense against UTSA, but because Joshua Cephas as bad as the offense was for UTSA had a really good game. And we saw a year ago how Houston kind of escaped a very close game just because McCaffrey had a better than average game. Right. And so we can't let one of those things transition into the other, but if you've got other things you think I missed, or if you've got additional things that you'd like to hear talked about, make sure you hit comments down below. If you use hashtag every day with a question, we'll try and answer it on Friday's episode. So we do hashtag every day with a question. We'll see if we can come back and answer one or two of those discreetly, if not more, on Friday's episode. Thank you all so much for listening to Locked on Cougs and making us your first listen of the day. We appreciate it a lot in football season. Football is a fun time to be a Houston Cougar fan. It's a fun time to be a Houston sports fan in general right now, actually. Lots of excitement in the air. That's why I'm recommending Locked on Astros as your second listen of the day. Thank you all so much again. Locked on Cougs, proud member of Locked on Podcast Network, and that means your team every day. Go Cougs. I don't think they could see the hand that time. Yeah, it didn't come off very well. I don't know. Go Cougs.